This conference will now be recorded. All right, I'll start with uh, this patient. So this patient had an upper abdominal procedure, which I will not tell you about for the moment, after which apparently the patient experienced acute respiratory distress and substantial hypoxemia. So this radiograph obtained just after the procedure, very soon thereafter, looks like this. What do we see? Very small static lung volumes. Substantial opacities in the lower lungs consistent with atelectasis. So that's actually the 24th on the 20. Second, I don't know if they took a radiograph, but they took a CT just after. And it shows the same findings. So we see small static lung volumes, basal lung opacities, consistent with atelectatic lung. So they procedure was a celiac axis neurolysis done under endoscopy guidance for that procedure for chronic abdominal pain, apparently from chronic pancreatitis. So they basically go in and under ultrasound guidance, they inject local anesthetic or alcohol into the celiac ganglion because that ganglion contains a lot of sensory fibers related to abdominal pain. So that was the procedure. And CK was also substantially elevated. Now, apparently, this procedure, which was done, so that was not the next day, Apparently, at that place, this was read as diaphragms moving because there was a concern about the alcohol, the hemidiaphragms, and the adjacent phrenic nerves. So here is a sequence. Now, I'll play that a bit slower. just give you a moment to look at that. Now, I find it very difficult to interpret a series of images from a study that I didn't personally do, because you can't tell what breathing instructions are being used. You can't necessarily tell whether the patient's upright or recumbent. And from the point of view of analyzing hemidiaphragm motion, that's a problem, particularly if the concern is for bilateral hemidiaphragm dysfunction. So I'll stop that. And I don't think these hemidiaphragms are moving properly. Now, one potential substantial pitfall when looking for hemidiaphragm motion, particularly bilateral, is the problem of relative motion. So patients, of course, will use the accessory muscles of respiration, the scalenes, the intercostal muscles, to try to inflate the rib cage. So the rib cage will move. And the problem of relative motion is whether, if you see the hemidiaphragms apparently moving, are they actually moving? Um, it's kind of that relative motion thing of, if you're at a train station, the train next to you moves, you might get the sensation that you're moving. But one way to try to avoid that pitfall when doing the study yourself, it is said, is to take the lower collimation edge here of the fluoroscope and position it just below the hemidiaphragms. And when evaluating hemidiaphragm motion, try to evaluate hemidiaphragm motion relative to that fixed geometry, not the rib cage that's moving. And I find it also helpful when I do these exams is to have a resident 
or a technologist or someone else look at the patient's chest wall and say in, out, in, out. So they say in when they see the chest wall, the ribs, the clavicle moving. So I don't have to concentrate on that. And I will just look at the hemidiaphragms relative to the fixed external collimation edge. So here is the problem of relative motion. So for example, right here, you can see the rib cage moving right here. And of course, the lungs can be inflated a bit from that, but are the diaphragms actually contracting nicely? Certainly, if that's the total excursion of the diaphragms that I'm just flicking through here, that's not normal. So even though supposedly they thought the hemidiaphragms are moving, um, I'm skeptical about that for the reasons that I mentioned. So what happens over time if one diagnoses, and oh, by the way, the clinician here thought or speculated that the needle may inadvertently have actually been placed in hemidiaphragm muscle or partly in hemidiaphragm muscle or something like that to cause the CK elevation. So there was some speculation about that. So now we image the patient over time and you'll see from say this CT, which is now in January, that procedure was done in September. We do have better inflation of the lungs, for sure. Still foci of subsegmental atelectasis there, but much better inflation of the lungs compared to before. And then, of course, we do have a previous CT for comparison. So if we bring that in, and in the case of asking the question, what does the hemidiaphragm muscle look like now, today, on the most recent CT, with respect to the possibility of a substantial and durable injury of phrenic nerves, for example. We can evaluate the bulk of the hemidiaphragm muscle, including the posterior hemidiaphragms and the crura, and certainly I don't see the kind of atrophy that I would expect to see if the phrenic nerves were not functioning. There's still some muscle bulk here, as we see right over here. And now I'll just- The left cruise though is a little bit thinner. It is a bit thinner here, but I, I don't know what to make of that because it's not really thinner there or there. But and comparing just like the left cruise on the uh, study on the right with the left cruise on the study on the left. Does look a bit thinner. It does. But you know, it's it's not here. It's not really thin there. No, I agree. And it's not really thin there, and it's not so thin there. So, and you know, if we look at the, let me bring in the coronal from January. You know, typically with substantial hemidiaphragm paralysis, the entire muscle of the diaphragm would be thinned. And here, there's still pretty good muscle, I think. Let's go say anterior in the chest. This is not the muscle bulk I would expect with substantial phrenic nerve bilateral hemidiaphragm paralysis over months. So I said, I don't think there's substantial injury. Here's the cross. It's not that thin, but maybe it's a little bit. Time will tell. Now, there was another fluoro study done that was done here, but I had the same problem trying to interpret images uh, from a procedure I didn't do myself, and I couldn't confirm that those hemidiaphragms were not moving on the most recent uh, procedure. So just for a quick summary of this case, we have this. There's the anatomy of the celiac plexus relative to diaphragm, very close to where the phrenic nerves all run through. And same thing there. You can see here's a case report of that as a complication. Can happen. Tolerating NIV. I don't know what NIV is. Don't know able to wean of oxygen with rest and exertion. 
Any other thoughts, guys? Are no, I think that it's yeah, a nice discussion. Yeah. So there may be some question about that left crisp being a little bit atrophied, but not to the degree that I would say is a slam dunk for paralysis. Okay, let me show you this case. So this case um, came to me by a pulmonology, pulmonology colleague. And the question was, I see opacity consolidation in the left lower lobe, and it's persistent on imaging. And I don't know why. What do you think about the case? So left lower lobe consolidation ostensibly is the, the pulmonologist's concern. So there's going to be a story here, but let me go to an exam from October. And first off, this is the opacity that is persistent. And I'll bring alongside it the non-contrast most recent one. So October, January. First off, in looking at this, this is very nicely enhancing lung typical of adelectatic, but not consolidated lung. Vessels are close together, some air in the bronchi, and this is what it looks like. So yes, it's persistent, but it is adelectatic lung, not consolidated lung. Then I saw findings consistent with surgery, and it turned out that the surgery was performed in September of last year, a cabbage. And then I noticed something interesting down here. Let's go to down here, January. And we do have a comparison CT from before, which is here. So this is September of last year. Bingo. This is atrophied. So diagnosis, left phrenic nerve injury during surgery, left hemidiaphragm paralysis, and explaining the adelectatic lung. This is bedside radiography before surgery. This shows the elevation post-op. Left hemidiaphragm is a bit up. Lateral projection, left hemidiaphragm a bit up. So confident diagnosis of left phrenic nerve injury and explaining the left lower lobe atelectasis. So Howard, um, that's a nice example. I Sometimes I see this, you know, immediately post-op. When do you decide that it's not transient, that it's, um, you know, it is truly a phrenic nerve injury versus just temporary uh, palsy? Um, you know, here of... we're seeing the evolution of this atrophy mm -hmm. over months from September to now. It's going to take time to develop. And I think it's just the appearance and the evolution of it over months, particularly over months. And then supposedly a fluoro was done again by somebody else that showed the left hemidiaphragm not moving properly. But I don't have that to show you. David? Okay. Could you show us a coronal uh, view yes. on the, at the time of... Um... The thinning posterior. Let, let's go anteriorly and okay. see, if, see if we can see anterior muscle asymmetry. Okay. So we go here. Let me just go to anterior. Back in the day. Versus. Yeah. So it here it's thinned out. Um, I think we thinned out here as well. Yeah. So th that anterior muscle th thinning on the uh, coronal is really helpful. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's a definite definite change. <clears throat> the thing is, I've seen sometimes when I think you can have sort of segmental phrenic nerve dysfunction. Uh -huh. I saw somebody who'd had a tube thoracostomy and for a long time, and it was probably it was sitting along the diaphragm, and they had they had good muscle th thickness posteriorly, but they had lost muscle thickness anteriorly. So they might have 
caught a branch of the phrenic nerve. There are three main branches. Um, you know, there's an anterior, posterior, and then kind of a medial and lateral branch. So you can pick off one of those branches with things like a drain that's leaning on it for a long time. <clears throat> and uh, muscle will be thin in that segment, but not necessarily everywhere. Okay. Now, the thing is that these people can recover up to a year and a half later. So okay. even though it is a real injury, if they didn't actually transect the nerve and the sheath is still intact, the nerve can regrow from the point of imaging as long as it's got those channels in the nerve sheath to grow down and it can reconstitute itself. It grows about a millimeter a week or something like that. It takes a long time, but up to a year and a half, people can recover after a heart surgery. Okay. But if the nerve is transected, then you don't have any chance of regrowth. Cool. Cool. Okay. Next really interesting case is this one. So my pathology colleague said, I've got this uh, surgical lung biopsy and it's got some really interesting findings in it. I'm, I see granulomas and I'm, I'm thinking about um, sarcoidosis. It's in the context of a patient, as I'll show you more details in a moment, with inflammatory bowel disease. She's been treated with different regimens over time. Um, but this is what a CT looks like. So look at these opacities here in the lower lungs, circumscribed, multiple, subpleural, spherical, the largest one here, right middle lobe, a slightly ill-defined margins with adjacent lung, no ground glass attenuation next to it. So that's at a point in time, August. And then I looked through the whole series. Now I'm, of course, looking at this after the biopsy was done, which was the biopsy was done, surgical lung biopsy in January. And this is two days before the surgical lung biopsy. I'll mention that in the interim, they try to make a diagnosis by navigation bronchoscopy. These little images are from the ION device. That didn't yield a, yield a diagnosis. A CT guided biopsy, November, did not reveal a diagnosis. So as I mentioned, they went ahead and did a surgical lung biopsy. But I looked at this and I thought, wait a minute, it's kind of interesting. They did a biopsy surgical for resolving, resolving lung opacities. They sure did. So spontaneous resolution of these, almost complete, but not completely complete, has occurred, but they did a biopsy. So I thought that's really interesting. So she said, have you ever seen sarcoid do this? I said, well, it's pretty unusual, but there is this thing descriptively called alveolar sarcoidosis, where sometimes you can get fairly large opacities, even with air bronchograms, and could it be that? She said, it's also necrotizing. So then we kept on thinking, what would you guys think of before I show anything else? <laughs> well, there's that controversial entity of what is it called? Like necrotizing sarcoid granulomatosis. It's like some weird vasculitis yeah. thing, but. Yeah, that's what um, she was thinking. And then, you know, we talked about it and she said, well, what else would you think of in IBD? I said, well, uh, necrobiotic nodules. Very rarely the patients can get a thing called pulmonary pyoderma gangrenosum. Drugs, drug toxicity. What about drugs? So the drug that she was on, and I'll show you that in a moment, is a monoclonal antibody to Integrin. And that was the most recent therapeutic regimen. And it turned out that that drug, the last dose, was in August. 
So they thought about that, thought about that, and eventually we got a consultation because there were some really interesting findings. First of all, the necrotizing process wasn't really primarily an airway-centric one. So, here's the history. Necrotizing granulomatous arteritis primarily, bits and bronchiolitis, but particularly arteritis. Vedalizumab is the name of the drug. This is the report from the consultant pulmonary pathologist. Unusual for inflammatory bowel disease, the absence of granulomas in relation to the pleural regions and the interlobular septa against sarcoidosis and they apparently had seen this in the past in relation to other drugs for a necrotizing arteritis. Couldn't find a case report of this necrotizing arteritis for this particular drug, but that is what we think it is. So there's kind of the summary. So here's some really nice images substantial arteritis associated with a vessel, maybe some old infarcts, maybe some of those opacities are going to stay because they're actually small collagenous lung infarcts, some granulomas, but a conspicuous necrotizing granulomatous arteritis of medium-sized artery. with some airway-related bronchiolitis. But this over here explains the case, I think, very nicely. Absence of subpleural interlobular septal granulomas against sarcoidosis. So we think this is a drug reaction to the vedolizumab as a necrotizing granulomatous process involving primarily small arteries of lung. Isn't that cool? Very neat. Okay. And last uh, pathology. Same kind of thing. Pathology colleague said, got a patient that uh, had a surgical lung biopsy for supposedly nodular disease. Okay. Yes, nodular disease of lung. Patient is a smoker. So scrolling through here fast, let me get uh, the non-contrast rather than the contrast. So let's, see, let's start down here. Down here, we have a lot of hyperattenuation abnormality in these lungs, very opaque. Used to call this desquamative interstitial pneumonitis. Try not to use that term now in favor of just massive accumulation of smoker's macrophages in the lungs. Yes, the granulomas all over the place. Little cystic space there. And then as we come up here, I'm going to change to the coronal because the coronal really nicely shows the morphology of the non-calcified nodules up here. And I'll just hesitate momentarily when we get to some that are stellate shaped like there. And up here. And here, very nice, irregularly shaped nodule, kind of stellate. And I said, oh, this is super typical for PLCH. Okay, so here we go. Actually, some of the small nodules had actually resolved. So it's not. It's interesting that they went ahead that biopsy without going through the ILD conference at all. Nodule, calcified, non-calcified, nodule, stellate, stellate lesions, calcified granulomas, unrelated, smoker's macrophages. Emphysema, tons of smoker's macrophages. Some of the interalveolar septa, pink staining, very pink staining, consistent with SRIF 
expanding those interlobular septa, some of the granulomas there. There's a nice stellate lesion. There's a nice stellate, very cellular lesion. Beautiful S100 staining the Langerhan cells in a stellate lesion. CD1A staining those cells again. So really nice imaging path correlation, PLCH. Nice. Yeah, those stellate okay. lesions look look like little Medusa heads in the on the histopathology where the inflammatory cells infiltrate the adjacent. In, in there. Yeah. Really, that's a particularly yeah. pretty one. Yeah, look at that. These guys. All right. Very cool. All right. Those are mine. Thank you, Howard. All right, David, do you have any cases? I do. All right. So can you see the top of a CT scan? Yes. Yep. Okay, um, this person has <clears throat> um, a lung nodule down here. And then in the upper abdomen has this <clears throat> that stranding here anteriorly. <clears throat> and um, as in the right inguinal region, an abnormality here. This was biopsied and this was mesothelioma. So this is probably part of the perineal mesothelioma up here. So um, we do have mesothelioma. We also have this kidney cancer going on over here. So we have a kidney tumor and this person then has a history of a cerebral melanoma. The typical melanoma that is seen in conjunction with kidney cancers and <clears throat> mesotheliomas, usually pleura, but in this case, peritoneal, uh, is a choroidal melanoma of the eye, but skin lesions also occur. So this is all the result of a germline BAP1 mutation. Um, a lot of the mesothelioma cases that are coming through these days are actually BAP1 related. The typical triad is mesothelioma, melanoma, and kidney cancers. This person has all three, and that's a result of this germline mutation. This person has a positive family history, two, two brothers, I think, with who also developed uh, mesotheliomas. So uh, it seems to be from the mother's side of the family. So the BAP1 mutation, I don't know, you, have you guys heard of this before? BAP1? No, yes, now I have. Okay. <laughs> okay. BAP1 mutation. It's a germline mu mutation, and BAP1 is it stands for BRCA-related uh, BRCA-associated protein. So it's downstream from the BRCA genes, you know, BRCA1 and 2 that are associated with breast and ovarian cancers. So this is downstream in that molecular pathway. I don't, I, I don't have more, you know, clear-cut information than that. But um, several of the cases of mesothelioma I've seen lately have occurred with BAP1 mutations and the people have other tumors as well. Now the prognosis for these tumors, for the uh, mesothelioma is somewhat better in this condition. It seems to be a more indolent course of mesothelioma. It's not as aggressive and resulting in early death. And so they can be uh, sort of held off and they do, do respond to therapy. So, you should be aware of BAP1 mutation. If you encounter a um, mesothelioma, check the kidneys and make sure that the clinicians have thought about it. And if somebody has a melanoma as well, or a known kidney cancer, and you come up with mesothelioma, it's probably a germline mutation of BAP1. Now, uh, in some of the mesothelioma cases, they will find a BAP1 mutation in the tumor. It's not germline in that situation. So you can have spontaneous BAP1 mutations that give rise to mesotheliomas, not in the germline, but this pathway is definitely implicated now in mesothelioma. Okay, this person didn't have any markers of asbestos exposure. There was no pleural plaque. Okay, now, meanwhile, back to the diaphragm. This person um, developed 
shortness of breath on bending over to do work on a transmission. So this is called bendopnea. Bendopnea, when people get short of breath when they bend over to tie their shoes. It was originally described about, I think, 2012 in heart failure patients. So it can be a marker of, of uh, heart failure in that when you bend over and you increase abdominal pressure, you can uh, change blood flow back to the heart and so forth. So it can be from cardiac, but it occurs in a, a lot of the diaphragm, people who have diaphragm dysfunction. If you uh, have an, you know, a weak diaphragm and you bend over, you increase your abdominal pressure, you make it very hard for the diaphragm to pull down against that increased pressure. So bendopnea goes uh, with diaphragm dysfunction, not just cardiac dysfunction. And a number of patients that I've seen for diaphragm fluoros have spontaneously told me that. I now ask them if they get short of breath bending over to tie their shoes uh, from a sitting position. So this person developed this uh, elevation of the left hemidiaphragm. It came up in December and it was there again in January. So we have an old radiograph in this person from 2010. And you can see that back then the left hemidiaphragm was in normal position. And since um, mid-December, it has been elevated in this position. And the elevation goes all the way to the back chest wall, which suggests that this could well be paralysis. It, it would be unlikely to be eventration because eventration will usually try to get back to normal height posteriorly. It won't stay elevated all the way to the back chest wall. So we're very suspicious that this is uh, a diaphragm dysfunction. <clears throat> Now, the interesting thing in this person, okay, well, let, let's look at CT. The CT was around the time of, in mid-December when this occurred, um, when this elevation first was apparent on a chest radiograph when the man went in because of his shortness of breath. Um, and you can see that at this point, there's still respectable muscle thickness here of the cruise. And however, if you compare it to the right, you can see that there's a little bit of actually hypertrophy on the right. So we do have asymmetry. This is pretty normal thickness here, but perhaps this was hypertrophied symmetrically with the other one before. And we're actually seeing what looks normal here is still not normal um, because it used to be hypertrophied. Also notice that the anterior muscle thickness is respectable on that side but it is less than what we're seeing on the other side. So it may be that we have hypertrophy here. And so this is, the right side is not a good comparison. And let's look at the coronal because that makes this anterior diaphragm comparison better. So if you look at it here, you see that the right um, heavy diaphragm muscle is nice and thick. It's a little bit hypertrophied. This is a contrast study. It's also, you know, very dense. Its margins are sharp, but look at the left. The left is fuzzy. It seems a little speckled and stuff like that. So I think we actually have some edema in this muscle. So I think this muscle is probably damaged. It's just not as crisp and dense as the muscle on the other side, even though it's not thin at this point. And it's possible that if, if we have a new CT scan, uh, we would see that there's now some atrophy on this side. But this is, you know, this uh, diaphragm muscle thickness is okay anteriorly here, but the muscle just doesn't look normal. It's speckled and it has fuzzy margins. I think it's edematous. I don't think it's healthy uh, muscle with lots of protein as we have on the other side. So <clears throat> this man, <laughs> back to genetics. This man uh, has had a diagnosis of Parsonage Turner syndrome on his right side in the past. So he had this episode of severe shoulder pain on the right uh, that came on out of the blue. It wasn't, he was not aware of a preceding viral syndrome and he'd not had any injury, but he suddenly had all of this, this tremendous shoulder pain and stuff like that. And he was alert to the diagnosis of Parsonage Turner because he has two brothers, one of whom has had Parsonage Turner four or five times, and the other brother has had Parsonage Turner once. So um, let me see if I can bring up an article here. There is an article on hereditary Parsonage Turner syndrome, which is also called neuralgic amyotrophy. And I know I've got the, a PDF sitting in here someplace, but I couldn't get it into a good position to uh, show you easily. But just take my word for it. 
there's a strong likelihood that this man has a hereditary um, Parsonage Turner syndrome. And perhaps what's happened to him then in December is he has Parsonage Turner now involving his left hemidiaphragm. Hmm. So is Parsonage the, Turner, the, typically they have bad shoulder or neck pain. It can go down the arm. They can get some muscle weakness in that distribution. And then they get they find themselves short of breath. And it turns out they have an elevated hemidiaphragm on that side. And it often reverts within six months or a year. It can go away. We did have one of our radiology faculty had this condition about 10 years ago. You know, was a was an exerciser, was an avid runner, found himself short of breath, had an elevated hemidiaphragm, and it got better in the course of a year. His left hemidiaphragm, or his whichever hemidiaphragm it was, went back to normal position, and he regained. Uh, he was no longer short of breath. We're hey, David, is it the thumbnail at the bottom of your screen there? There's a PDF one just above the little CT thumbnail. Yeah, I was a little worried about that. Oh, okay, sorry. Can you, can you edit that out? Yes, I will. Here we go. Okay, so there's a gene on chromosome, I think it's 17, yeah, it's 17. So SEPT9 gene can result in hereditary neuralgic amyotrophy. So most people haven't heard of Parsons Turner and now it turns out there's a genetic variation. So, um, and it can be familial. So this, this man probably has that condition, but we've not done the genetic analysis. So here's this sniff test. And you can see that he does have some, this is standing, he does have some function of that left hemidiaphragm, but it's not at all what the right one can do. And when he sniffs, you'll see that it does jerk upward there, it's going up over it a little bit. Where the other one's going down, and this one is going up. Here, it's it's uh, bouncing up, and then it goes goes back down. So, on lateral view, he is able to resist most of the paradoxical motion posteriorly. So I know there's some muscle function posteriorly. It's the dome that um, that jumps up more. So this just rel indicates relative weakness. Paradoxical motion does not equal paralysis. It just indicates that it's not as strong as other parts. And so the motion is being dictated by the other parts, and this is partly responding out of weakness. Once again, it's like arm wrestling. The person who loses the arm wrestling is not paralyzed. It's just weaker than the other guy. So um, paradoxical motion is the same thing. It's relative weakness. It's not. You don't have to be paralyzed. Okay, so I've lost at arm wrestling a number of times. It doesn't mean I'm paralyzed. It just means I'm not as strong as the other two. Okay. Okay, now the, you know, the best part of the sniff test um, is to put the person supine because like sniffing, it's a stress test for the diaphragm. So this is the same person now supine. And if they still have some motion when they're supine, I know that, um, you know, it's not completely paralyzed. So Notice the supine, we get this very good motion on the right. Um, and we do get some motion on the left, just a little bit. So that implies that we still have some strength on that side, okay, but not much. So I concluded that this diaphragm, left hemi diaphragm, was severely uh, weakened, but probably not completely paralyzed. And um, if the fact that that um, CT scan didn't show a lot of atrophy, still showed some decent muscle thickness, probably, um, indicates that there is some chance for recovery. So I think that persistence of some muscle thickness, not complete atrophy, uh, does go along with the possibility of recovery. So we're just going to have to wait and see if this comes back in six months or even a year. Okay, so perhaps he, given his family history and his um, having had Parsonage Turner diagnosed on the other side, this may be a familial version of Parsonage Turner related to a SEP9 gene mutation. Okay, speaking of diaphragms, here's an elevated right hemi diaphragm. I thought symmetry is important. And you can see that the elevation <clears throat> decreases posteriorly, it gets back to near normal height. This shape here where it does have a steep posterior slope uh, says that this is probably eventration and not paralysis. And on CT scan, um, 
we, um, we have a reason for this elevation here. We have this tremendous polycystic disease of the liver and both kidneys here. So polycystic disease with this massive um, liver here is taking advantage of our of the relative um, the relatively easier uh, stretching of the right hemidiaphragm compared to the left. That's why eventration is more common on the right than the left, because you've got unsupported diaphragm here. It's not being buttressed by the heart sitting on it the way the left hemidiaphragm is, and there are big areas there with, that are susceptible to stretch when you have increased abdominal pressure, in this case from this polycystic disease in organomegaly. So it's stretching the right hemidiaphragm upward and it's more susceptible to stretching and eventration than the left. We have, um, we don't have robust muscle thickness here, but it's symmetrical on both sides. And if we go anteriorly, we can see that the, the typical shape of eventration we've got Here's right hemidiaphragm here, and then it bulges above that. So we've got pretty good thickness of anterior right hemidiaphragm at this point, a sudden transition, and it's actually folding back. That's Howard's term for folding of the diaphragm. It bulges through the eventration, and the eventration is sort of sitting like a mushroom on top of this. This is not herniation. It's just stretching of that eventration, and it actually becomes redundant and lies over the the more the unstretched part here. Okay, so it's supported, the hemidiaphragm is supported here by its attachments to the anterior ribs, but you get just an inch behind that, and this the right hemidiaphragm is not supported, and it can stretch like this and form this big eventration. So this is a gigantic eventration here, and it's um, that's where this abdominal pressure can be relieved by stretching that right hemidiaphragm and causing eventration. Okay. Good. And let's see if I can remember what this next case is. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, this person um, <clears throat> has a left axillary intraaric balloon. Here's the introducer in the left axillary artery. So this is an upside down. Uh, balloon with a proximal marker here in the aortic arch and then the balloon inflated down here. So one question to ask your residents is do they know what gas they use to inflate these intraortic balloons and the answer is helium. So it's helium in this balloon. You definitely wouldn't want to have nitrogen in there in case the balloon burst you'd have a bad case of the bends. And at this point here is the uh, here is the tip of the intraortic balloon down here. So it's usually 25 centimeters between the proximal marker and the marker at the tip. So 25 centimeters of intraortic balloon here. And it, you'd like to actually position this at the lower aspect of the arch. So maybe a couple centimeters lower would be great. Okay, but this is not so bad. But then things deteriorated. And notice that the marker is moving up. And uh, it continues at this point. You don't really see the marker anymore. You see the balloon inflated into the arch. But if you look carefully, the marker's over here. So mm. this thing has now gone over the arch, and it's probably folded back like this. So it's coming in from here. It goes down here, and then it connects to this inflated part here, which is actually an ascending aorta. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit that I did not pick this up on this radiograph, but I did the next day um, that this thing was way back in the aortic arch. And so here it is again, you can see this component here in the ascending aorta, and here's the marker over here, it sort of blends in with astronomy wires, extra tricky at this point. So mm -hmm. it's important to recognize these things, these axillary, this axillary approach, intraortic balloon is kind of a slippery operation, it's very easy to have these things move around a lot, they pull out a lot, more than they did from when they're placed from the groin. Now we happen to have a CT on this person with the balloon in place. And you can see at this point, the balloon is inflated in the uh, descending aorta. And at this point, it's it's going through the arch and it's actually coming back into ascending aorta here. So here it is, let's try sagittal. Um, so it's going all the way over the arch. So this is not mm -hmm. what you want. So what this is doing is putting at risk the carotid artery takeoffs because these balloons by pulsing can damage those arteries. 
plus when this are when this balloon inflates <clears throat> in diastole you could actually uh, occlude those carotid arteries you don't want to get like 60 tias uh, a minute from this this balloon pulsation so you want this distal you want the inflating part to be distal to the left subclavian you don't want to endanger those brachiocephalic arteries okay mm. so counter pulsation balloon is not uh, probably not helping this person that much okay now i showed this case um a couple of weeks ago it's a case of systemic arterialization to the um, left lower lobe here we have this big artery that's mm -hmm. coming off the aorta sort of winds around bends around a little bit and then it supplies part of the left lower lobe and there's no sequestration in this case we have normal airway communication we have nice bronchi in that left lower lobe that connect to the central airway so we don't have we're not sequestered from the airway which is the real definition of sequestration it's it's removal from the normal airway communication and here's what this vessel looks like on on a coronal view you can see it's a little bit tortuous in its takeoff but it basically replaces the um, pulmonary artery in the left base and if we go back to the cross section you'll see that that left base looks kind of hyperemic because it's being bathed with systemic uh, pressures compared to the vessels on the other side so the vessels are fatter and we're seeing more of them uh, what i didn't realize when i showed this case before is that basically this um this pulmonary artery or this systemic artery is replacing um the normal pulmonary artery perfusion at that lower lobe so we have pulmonary artery here let's just track that down you can see that the big branches go off laterally and not much goes posteriorly mm -hmm. then this vessel comes in and pretends to be um here here it is basically following the course that the once it gets to this level that the left pulmonary artery would normally follow and then it completes the perfusion to the lower lobe so it's not as if it's supplementing it's actually replaced the pulmonary artery in that area so i'm really glad jeff is on board with this case so um i didn't really replace i recognize this as kind of replacing this segment of pulmonary artery uh but just i thought it was just you know perfusing that left lung base so we've seen pulmonary ar sorry systemic arteries go to lung bases before and they often go through the pulmonary ligament but they don't try to hug the the um, position and sort of that a a normal pulmonary artery would have taken so this is the first one time i've really recognized that this is replacing not just supplementing a uh, pulmonary artery to that part of the lung so sadako showed me a case yesterday um unremarkable radiograph here uh just a little atelectasis and you know you can't really see any vascular abnormality down there but this person has an even more dramatic example of over perfusion of that lower lobe and then a big let me give you a better window here a big systemic artery coming off the aorta here and then this one tracks back to the hilum more clearly and becomes the supply to the pulmonary artery in that part of the lower lobe so this is a bigger section it's most of the lower lobe here is actually perfused by this systemic artery which is basically filling in for the pulmonary artery which doesn't go there so this is once again has replaced the pulmonary artery to the left lower lobe it's a bigger territory than that last case the same idea but this case really made clear that there's this replacement ad, um, aspect to this thing and then i recognized that the case i'd shown two weeks ago was the same thing but just not as dramatic as this case so um you know this this is a different pattern of systemic arterialization than i've been aware of before and i wonder what you what you guys have as a take on this sort of thing well i have two theories on this first you know that 
embryonic embry, during embryogenesis, the systemic communication to the lung that are present and they regress. And maybe this is like atresia of the, you know, that low bar pulmonary artery. So that's why they persist. Cause clearly these are congenital given how big they are and they're not, it's not neovascularity. The other possibility is that in your case, your first case that the um, pulmonary is small and because the systemic artery has a much higher pressure, it preferentially is going to perfuse the lung. Um, so that over as the patient grows, that um, the pulmonary artery just kind of doesn't grow along because there's no need for it. Right. Okay. So um, I think I think one of the other aspects of this is that the um, it's the location of this pulmonary artery that it actually tries to pick up its it picks up its communication near the hilum. Um, unlike uh, the other systemic arteries that I can recall just by memory, which often go through the pulmonary ligament, it doesn't really try to get that close to the hilum to imitate the attachment that uh, the normal mediastinal pulmonary artery would have to the lung pulmonary artery. So, um, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit where, it, where it's coming off that I think um, makes this pattern a little you see it really gets in very close here to where the normal attachment of mediastinal to a lung pulmonary artery would be it gets back very close to the hilum there so yeah i think i mean i think you you've got it jeff there we we know there are all these communications that there's all this segmental anatomy going on and then a lot of the segments um sort of um give way and this was one place where i think our our worm-like original anatomy persisted in this location and it's interesting that this is the you know we've got two cases here where it's on the left i don't think i've seen this pattern on the right where it comes up close to the hilum and then feeds the pulmonary artery and um this is also where sequestration is most common this left lower lobe so i have a feeling that um, segmental anatomy uh doesn't regress with the same regularity on the left the way it regresses on the right. So I'm extrapolating a lot from just two cases. Right. But, you know, I've seen isolated systemic arterial supply much more commonly on the right. Usually yeah, a small I, branch coming off the, you know, from the abdomen, the, the right. inferior phrenic, the aorta. But, yeah. um, but you're right, sequestrations allegedly are more common on the left. Who knows if that's really true. But yeah, this is interesting because this is like a sequestration size artery. But you're right. right, the OA is not sequestered. So it must have, the lung must have formed normally, um, whereas with the sequestration, you know, that that budding doesn't um, happen normally. So it's just probably the timing at when the regression occurs. So there's, who, who knows, probably some insult or something that leads to these. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I will show just one case while we're talking about anatomy. Um, this is kind of cool. This is something I've been looking for for a long time. So, um, you know, we, we see accessory fissures all the time. Um, and sometimes you can pick up an inferior accessory fissure on a lateral radiograph and on a, a sagittal, sometimes you can, I mean, on a frontal and on a, on a lateral, sometimes you can pick up a, a superior accessory fissure. But this patient has one of the most robust horizontal fissures on the left I've ever seen. Um, I've seen it like one other time, I and mean, I see it on CT a lot, but never want a radiograph. But this patient's kind of cool. So this was just a lung nodule surveillance. Um, and you can see there's the horizontal fissure on the right. But this patient's already had an upper lobectomy um, for one cancer. But look at this horizontal fissure on the left. It's pretty much complete. There's a presumed lung cancer there, and there's a, has a little friend down here. Um, but notice it goes all the way down. So it nicely separates the lingula. The, the whole lingular segment from the rest of the upper lobe, there's maybe a tiny gap right in here. So um, in theory, if they they could do it, I mean, they are doing more sublobar resections, but this would be a fairly easy surgery on this side because you already have a fissure. You could do a lingulectomy, assuming you had good mm. margins. But I've not seen a true left middle lobe. I mean, Travis and I've talked, we always refer to it just as the middle lobe because there isn't one on the left, and this is the exception to that rule. Uh, let me thicken it up a bit. But you can see it's just a little bit thinned out there. But it, you have a nice lingular, separate lingular lobe in this case. So I thought that was kind of cool. 
uh, mm -hmm. on the lateral. So Jeff, are they lateral, the bronchi, bronchi are normal on that side though? It's it's a uh, an upper and yep. a lower bronchus, right? Not a anterior and a and a right. lateral. No, nope. there's the conventional. There's the apical posterior, the anterior, and here's the lingula. And it's not it's not a, it's not a right lung. It's a it's a it's it's a. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a not really a middle lobe. Um, it's a lingula. It's a lingula, and so it's got the lingular bronchial arrangement, not the middle lobe bronchial. Right. The superior, yeah, they're not lateral and medial. They're they're rotated ninety degrees. So you've got the superior, and and it's a hyperarterial bronchus on this side. You can see. Lovely. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I, I just I've been waiting to see. And I see this fissure a lot, but it's usually incomplete, and you know, see it come and go a little bit. But I've ne I haven't seen it on a radiographs since I was a resident. And so here it is. That was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. All these years. So now, now I got to wait another, you know, couple decades. <laughs> <laughs> now you can retire. Uh, nah, I'm not allowed Re to retire. Reincarnation anymore. is required. Start again. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll save my other cases for next time. Well, thanks for the great cases. That was, that was very interesting. Cool. Thanks for doing All right. All right. Talk to you next week. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.